Okay, so let me read this question and then get started. It says a car runs on a baked curve. Let me just do, um, do a little bit of um, um, a doodling. <laughs> it helps me uh, make sure that I understood all the information in the question. So there's a curve of some radius. So let me draw the curve of some radius. Um, and it uh, says a car is rounding the curve. Um, so there's a car there somehow. Uh, if the coefficient of static friction between the road and the car is dead, okay, interesting. What is the maximum speed at which the car travels with the curve without sleeping? Ah, okay, so having read the question and uh, realizing what information it's asking, I don't think this uh, top view is the view that I want to um, draw my free body diagram in. It's going to be difficult to draw all the relevant forces in this view. So I'm going to use a slightly different view. Uh, let me call that a rear view. So I'm going to imagine that I'm looking at the car from the back. Um, so this is the car. Here's the road. And the car's velocity would be going into the uh, screen. That would be Vmax. And in this view, what's really difficult to portray is this radius of curvature. That's really why I didn't start out with this. But um, this view is the view that will help me draw the, the forces in a way that's illustrative. And while I'm on this view, what I need to realize is that this car, it's undergoing an acceleration that points to the center of the, this circle. There's a centripetal acceleration of this car. So when I draw free body diagram, I expect to see non-zero net force so that I can have this centripetal acceleration. So with this view in mind, now I'm finally going to start the, the standard strategy steps. And as a reminder, um, the standard strategy steps are, first, you should draw free body diagram, which I was about to do, and I'll do it soon. Two, you need to define your coordinate axis. And there's some consideration that goes in when you define them. Third, you need to uh, break forces into components if necessary. Here, I have a feeling it may not be necessary. And finally, once we've done steps one through three, then you will be ready to do step number four, writing down Newton's second law equations. Again, a lot of people want to skip to that. Please don't. <laughs> I have a lot of experience solving problems like this, and even I don't skip to step number four unless it's super simple. Because I do want to make sure I didn't forget anything, I didn't uh, mis uh, label, misunderstand some angle, um, that sort of stuff. So let me start out with the free body diagram. So my free body diagram, um, just the one, the car. And I'm using the rear view to draw this free body diagram. Uh, first, there uh, must be gravity. There's always gravity, so good to start out with the gravity. Uh, mass of the car times g. Oh, we are not given the mass. Ooh. I hope this will somehow cancel out as we write down equation. Oh. <laughs> so I know the car is not accelerating downward, so there must be some sort of support force that's supporting the car so that vertically it's not accelerating. And uh, because I figured out that the car must to be accelerating this way, as I look at this diagram, I know in my heart that this is an incomplete diagram. So when I ask myself the question, did I draw all the forces? No, I, I must have forgotten something. And the force that I forgot is the for force that should be coming from this point of contact. So there can be friction between the tire and the road. And that's the force that I haven't drawn. I need to have some kind of friction force. Uh, that must be why it's talking about without sleeping and why it's given me the uh, coefficient of static friction. So I'll be using this information to express this friction force and, um, and um, help me answer this. So, okay, now I think I have the complete free body diagram. With these three forces, I can make the acceleration go in the direction I know it must go in. So let me define the axis. Um, so I want my acceleration to be in the direction of positive x direction. So this is going to be my positive x, even though it's uh, you know leftward. But hey, that's the direction my acceleration is in, and um, upward to be uh, 
y direction as usual, or the you know direction perpendicular to the x direction. Um, and yeah, that's my axis. Uh, it makes sense within the context of the setup. And uh, I need to define uh, break forces into components. And here is where I see the simple simplification that all my forces are already in the direction of the axis, so I don't need to break anything down. I can basically skip step number three. But uh, you know, I wouldn't skip it until I see this, until I verify visually that oh, none of my forces need to be break down, broken down. So, you know, I'm not actually skipping it. I'm checking to see if I need to do anything here. So finally, step number four, I need to write down my Newton's law equations. I have only one object, but still two different axes to potentially worry about. So let me write down my Newton's law, Newton's second law equation for x axis first. My acceleration, which let me just stick with the A sub C symbol. It's going to be the net force, uh, which is just the friction force, no other forces in the vertical direction, divided by the mass. Um, okay. And um, you might think we can skip writing down equation for the y direction, but um, because you know it's a zero acceleration and normal force is equal to mg, kind of simple stuff. But I have a sense that I'm going to need that information, so let me write it in so that it's properly um, stated. So. Uh, the y acceleration, which will be zero, that's equal to the net force, normal force minus mg, divided by the mass of the thing. And again, I can imagine multiplying through by m to simplify all that so that the right hand side is really this that I worry about. So I have two equations one, two, and let's count the unknowns to see. Um, if we have enough inf information. So we have the acceleration, which we don't know. And we have um, friction force, which actually we don't know. We have normal force, which uh, we actually don't know. And it's even worse. There's actually a fourth unknown, Vmax, that we need to solve for. That's not even in the equations. <laughs> so, um, so we need a few more steps of work before we are able to say we can just do the rest of the math in sage math. Uh, so, you know, so, you know, this is where this is the end of the standard strategy. But as the situations get more complicated, you'll need to bring some a few additional things of your own to actually be able to solve this out. And one is the uh, what I started uh, out with, the identification that you must have acceleration and it's a centripetal acceleration. Recalling back to chapter four, when we did the, the circular motion, you should have this formula memorized that the centripetal acceleration can be related to the, the tangential velocity. So here I'm going to use Vmax as the uh, label. Uh, tangential velocity squared divided by radius of curvature for the circular motion. So this is going to become our equation three, which will do two things at the same time. It'll allow us to bring in the, the fourth unknown, the Vmax, and uh, it and it gives us a, a, a equation that we can use to relate things. And we are still one equation short. We only have uh, three equations and four unknowns. And that's where the fact that they've given us the coefficient of friction should be used and the relationship between the friction force and the normal force. And this is one of the steps that you do have to be careful. Now, for this particular question, if you happen to be not careful, you'll have found the correct answer anyway. But um, for the future potential scenario where it might not be. So the, the thing that you need to be careful is the distinction between the kinetic friction, which is defined as the coefficient times normal force, and the static friction. The static friction, there's actually no formula for static friction. The only thing you have is an inequality that says that the maximum value that this static friction force can be is the coefficient times the normal force. So in a lot of the scenarios where you are not dealing with the maximum friction force, maximum static friction force, you have to first start by saying, uh, I actually don't have a formula for static friction force. I'm, um, I'm rather um, in, uh, setting a condition that what we have was, is the static condition, and then from that figure out the friction force. Now here, what allows me to use the maximum value instead you know use the equality instead of the inequality is the fact that they are asking us for the maximum speed uh, 
So any speeds less than that, your static friction force will be less. And, uh, and the particular scenario we're looking for is when we do have the maximum speed, so our uh, static friction force will be at that maximum value. So uh, the coefficient that I labeled mu times the normal force. Uh, this is my fourth equation, and it didn't introduce any new unknown, just to reuse the unknowns that I've had before. So now we should have four equations, four unknowns. It should be solvable. So uh, from here, let me use the sage math in the interest of time and uh, just to, uh, making things easy for myself. So I'm just going to say use sage math. And uh, really, the fact that I'm going to be using sage math is one of the reasons I... Um, I wasn't all that careful about keeping my number of equations down. If I had to do all this by hand, I might have, you know, plug this in, plug this in to try to keep the number of equations down. But Sage Math is uh, so good at solving a uh, sy linear system of equations that I'm not going to bother to do that work. I'll just let Sage Math do that. Uh, let's see, I need G, uh, Vmax, R, you know, I think I got everything. If I forgot anything, it'll complain later. Um, so I need to define my equations. Equation one is acceleration is equal to friction force time oops, divided by mass. Um, oh, I might run into an issue. We'll see later. Um, equation two is equal to zero is equal to, and I'm going to simplify a little bit here. Instead of dividing by m, I'll say n minus mg. Uh, um, n minus m times g. And uh, so I'm writing down the version where I've multiplied the through by m already. Equation 3 is equal to um, ac. Why am I doing the parenthesis? ac is equal to uh, v max squared divided by r. Equation 4 is equal to friction force is equal to mu times n. Okay, uh, let me print all these equations to make sure I type them incorrectly, uh, compare them one by one. Yeah, typed it incorrectly. So I'm going to use the solve function to solve for this system of equations. And uh, I need to tell it four unknowns to solve for. They are the acceleration, friction force, um, normal force, and uh, Vmax. Yeah, the rest are known or presumed to be known. Um, so mass, I'm going to presume it to be known and maybe in the solution it'll have been cancelled out already or maybe I'll just have to uh, plug in some random value of mass <laughs> so that I can work out the number. Uh, let me put this into solutions uh, uh, variable. And okay, it gets me a solution. It looks like I have one set of... Wait, do I have... I have two sets of solutions. Oh, I have this and this. And what I suspect the difference is, yeah, one of them has a positive Vmax and the other one has negative Vmax. Because, yeah, I get that. Um, it was a squared, so uh, you either could have worked. So I'm going to take the second solution, which will give me the positive Vmax. So um, second solution. So let's look at... Um, Oh, I don't think I need all the uh, parameters because I'm only looking for Vmax. So uh, let me just um, take advantage of the fact that I'm using Sage Math. So, you know, I don't have to look at anything like acceleration. All those are intermediate steps. All I care about is 0, 1, 2, 3, the fourth um, element, which will give me Vmax directly. And I can substitute in all the numbers I have. My radius is 70 meters, making sure that it's basic SI units is 9.8 meter per second squared and yeah in this expression apparently mass has cancelled out i don't need it that's great uh, friction coefficient is 0 0.6 yeah vmax is 20.3 meter per second uh, so in miles per hour that should be close about approximately 40 which i guess makes sense for a local road type of situation so let me plug in uh, 20.3 uh, meters per second, yeah. Um, and, you know, if I was doing it by hand, it would have taken a few steps, you know, figuring out all this. And uh, 
So it's but you know I do encourage you to you know kind of look at the the intermediate uh, answers like the friction force to see if that actually makes a sense. You know, does it make sense that your friction force would be uh, five point eight times the the mass of the thing, <laughs> uh, which would be less than its weight, uh, like half of its weight? Um, so I hope uh, all of that makes sense based on the friction coefficient um, and all that stuff. So. So uh, the, the, do use the advanced two tools, which uh, will you know help speed up, up the problem solving and also help um, avoid getting stuck due to some silly mistakes here and there. So do use SageMath. I do encourage you to learn how to use it. Um, and while you're using that, uh, do make sure to develop your number sense and other intuitive feelings about your answer. Uh, take some time to explore your answer and make sure that it's what it's supposed to be.